The following video contains material that may be harmful, traumatizing, or offensive to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. The Nation of Islam, the organization that introduced us to W.D. Farad, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. But did you know about the men who founded their own groups based on the Nation of Islam's teachings? Today, we're going to talk about five infamous former members of the Nation of Islam, plus an important honorable mention. You are watching Black Belief. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and hit the notification bell so that you never miss a new video. Just in case you didn't watch my documentary entitled God is Here in Person, The Story of the Nation of Islam, let's quickly review some key points in the Nation of Islam's history. In 1930, Master W.D. Farad arrived in Detroit, Michigan and began teaching his interpretation of Islam to black Americans who had migrated to the industrial city from the South. In 1934, due to arrests and harassment from the police, Master Farad disappears, leaving the religious group in the hands of Elijah Muhammad, formerly known as Elijah Poole. In 1952, Malcolm X, formerly known as Malcolm Little, is paroled from prison and made assistant minister of Temple No. 1 in Detroit. Malcolm X had joined the Nation of Islam while he was incarcerated. In 1955, Louis Farrakhan, formerly known as Louis Eugene Walcott, joined the Nation of Islam. Within one year of joining, he was appointed to assistant minister and Malcolm X became his mentor. On March 8, 1964, Malcolm X announced he was splitting from the Nation of Islam. On March 5, 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated. On February 25, 1975, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad died and his son Wallace Muhammad assumed leadership of the Nation of Islam. Wallace Muhammad would later change his name to Imam Warth Muhammad. Imam Warth Muhammad denounced his father's teachings, changed the name of the organization, and sold off many of its business interests. On November 8, 1977, Louis Farrakhan split from Imam Warth Muhammad to reestablish the Nation of Islam under its previous teachings. Now that you have a very high-level view of the history of the Nation of Islam, let's get into the list of five of its most infamous ex-members. Clarence Edward Smith, also known as Allah the Father, founder of the Nation of Gods and Earths. Clarence Edward Smith was born in Virginia in 1928. His family eventually moved to Harlem, New York, where Clarence completed two years of high school. In the 1950s, he joined the military and was stationed in Korea for several years, where he learned martial arts. When he returned to the U.S., he found out that his wife had joined the Nation of Islam. He too decided to join, and his name was changed to Clarence 13X. By 1963, he was a high-ranking leader of Temple No. 7 in Harlem, New York, where Malcolm X was minister. As the fallout from Malcolm X's and Wallace D. Muhammad's departure occurred, Clarence 13 X began having his own doubts about the Nation of Islam's theology. He questioned why the Nation of Islam venerated Master Farad, who had light skin and mixed race ancestry, while also claiming that the black man was God. He finally decided to leave and start his own group called the Nation of Gods and Earths. Clarence was joined by a Nation of Islam member named John 37 X. Clarence changed his name to Allah the Father, and John changed his name to Abu Shahid. Together, the pair were called High Scientists since they engaged in intense study of Nation of Islam's doctrines and created new theologies for the group. In addition to being known as the Nation of Gods and Earths, the group was also known as the Five Percenters. This name refers to the Nation of Islam's teaching that 85% of the world are asleep and live in ignorance of the truth. Another 10% of the world know the truth, but have decided to suppress it. The remaining 5% know the truth and have the burden of going throughout the world to spread it. Allah the Father built upon several teachings of Orthodox Islam and the Nation of Islam, while also developing unique teachings with names like Supreme Mathematics, Supreme Alphabets, Actual Facts, and Solar Facts. Members were required to master each lesson and be able to use the teachings on demand to recruit new members. 
Unlike the Nation of Islam, the group did not establish a formal leadership structure. Since the group taught that all black men were gods, they believed that members should look within themselves for divine guidance. Allah the Father taught that women were earths and could not be gods because they were created by men. Instead, like the planet Earth, the woman's gift, according to Allah the Father, was the ability to sustain life. Another way the group deviated from the Nation of Islam was in its code of conduct. While Allah the Father warned against addiction, he did not believe that all drug use was wrong. Gambling, alcohol consumption, and smoking was allowed. Members were also allowed to decide how they dressed. Polygamy and serial monogamy was accepted. Allah the Father continued to strictly forbid consumption of pork, however. He also tended to be very strict about studying the lessons he had created. He and his followers spent long hours on Harlem street corners, proselytizing and inviting prospects to study meetings. Perhaps the nation of gods and earth's biggest impact was on music. As the genre of hip hop developed in New York, many early rap innovators incorporated 5%er teachings into their lyrics. Method Man, Rakim, Wu-Tang Clan, Nas, and many other iconic artists mainstream 5%er theology. Modern rap artists who were influenced by these early innovators also incorporated the 5%er ideology in their work. Unfortunately, Allah the Father would not live to see his ideas dominate the music charts. On June 13, 1969, at his home on 21 West 112th Street in Harlem, Allah the Father was assassinated. The identity of his attacker is not known. When Allah the Father created the Five Percenters, he began distributing lost-found Muslim lessons to potential followers. This angered members of the Nation of Islam, since these lessons were secret teachings that only high-ranking members were supposed to access. They were also angry that Allah the Father was able to recruit many disenfranchised members of the Nation of Islam into his group and that he opposed portions of the older organization's teachings. Thankfully, in the years since Allah the Father's assassination, most rivalries between the Five Percenters and the Nation of Islam have been set aside. Honorable Minister Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam, has attempted to build bridges between his organization and many other related groups. Today, the Five Percenters are largely perceived as a more philosophical counterpart to the Nation of Islam. Five Percenters frequently attend Nation of Islam events, and the Nation of Islam will often use their publications to praise certain aspects of the Five Percent movement. Ernest McGee, also known as Hamas Abdul Khalis, founder of the Hanafi movement. Ernest McGee was born in Indiana in 1921 to a Seventh-day Adventist family. Eventually, he converted to Roman Catholicism, and then later, after meeting a spiritual teacher, Tassabur Odin Rahman, he converted to Sunni Islam. FBI documents indicated that Ernest probably had a mental illness. He enlisted in the Army Reserve in 1942 and went active duty in 1943, but was medically discharged in 1944 with 70% disability. Army records indicate Ernest was diagnosed with psychosis dementia praecox paranoid type, which is now known as schizophrenia. From 1944 to 1968, Ernest visited Veterans Affairs doctors who documented his schizophrenic episodes. Even so, his disability percentage was steadily reduced until it was upheld at 30%. McGee joined the Nation of Islam in 1951, and his name was changed to Ernest 2X. He would later claim that his teacher had told him to infiltrate the Nation of Islam in order to convert its members to Sunni Islam. Ernest 2X entered the Nation of Islam at a time when Honorable Elijah Muhammad was working to rebuild its ranks after his release from jail for evading the World War II draft. Ernest 2X later claimed that he was closer to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad than Malcolm X, who was released from prison in 1953. He was made national secretary and invited to teach at the organization's school called the University of Islam. Ernest also later claimed that Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him personally that he was next in line to lead the Nation of Islam and not Malcolm X. 
Despite his alleged success in the organization, Ernest left the Nation of Islam and changed his name to Hamas Abdul Khalis. According to FBI documents, Ernest told agents that he left due to the, quote, arrogance and deceitfulness, end quote, of the Nation of Islam and the Gestapo tactics of the NOI temple officers at the Chicago Mosque. Throughout the 60s, Callis lived in New York and worked for nonprofit organizations where he helped struggling youth find employment. He also established religious centers where he introduced people to Hanafism, one of the four traditional Sunni schools of Islamic law. Callis' most famous convert was a basketball player named Lou Alcindor. Alcindor joined the movement in 1971 and changed his name to Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Jabbar was so committed to his new religion that he bought Callis a home in his neighborhood in Washington, D.C. In 1972, Callis moved into the home. He made one part of it a living space for his family, while another portion of the residence was called the Hanafi Muslim Center and was open to the public. The success of Callis's movement would derail quickly in December of 1972, when he sent 50 letters to Nation of Islam ministers around the country denouncing Honorable Elijah Muhammad. It's not clear who or what prompted him to send the letters. FBI records suggest that around this time, Callis suddenly became obsessed with fighting against non-Orthodox forms of Islam. In his letter, Callis called the Honorable Elijah Muhammad a, quote, living deceiver, end quote, and urged ministers to leave the organization. On January 18, 1973, Callis returned home from the grocery store to find seven members of his family murdered, including his children and grandchildren. Four of the children had been drowned in the bathtub. Seven murderers were detained, and all of them were identified as members of the Philadelphia Black Mafia. The Philadelphia Black Mafia, also known as the Black Muslim Mafia, was founded by Samuel Christian, also known as Suleiman Bey, who was a member of the Nation of Islam's Philadelphia Temple. Bey centralized control of the criminal activities in Black Philadelphia and aligned with the Italian Philadelphia crime family and the Italian Gambino crime family from New York to sell drugs and coordinate other illegal schemes. Many members of the Black Muslim Mafia were also members of the Nation of Islam, and profits from the Mafia were funneled through the local temple. Even the Nation of Islam's leadership in Chicago criticized the Philadelphia Mosque for drawing too much attention to itself and conducting itself as a, quote, gangster mosque, end quote. The Black Muslim Mafia has been connected to over 40 murders. I will need to do a separate episode on this organization to fully explore its violent legacy. Five of the murderers in the Hanafi killings were convicted, but two defendants were acquitted. No conspiracy charges against the Nation of Islam were filed. Callis was enraged that the killer's connection to the larger organization was never investigated. On March 9, 1977, Callis led a group of Hanafi Muslims as they stormed three buildings, the Wilson Building, the B'nai B'rith International Center, and the Islamic Center of Washington, and took hostages. During the takeover of the Wilson Building, News reporter Maurice Williams was shot and killed. D.C. Protective Service Division police officer Matt Cantrell and then-councilman Marion Barry were injured. During the attacks, Callis raged against the judge who presided over the trials of his family's murderers, claiming that he was part of a Jewish conspiracy to subvert justice. Callis made several demands. First, he wanted the release of the film entitled Muhammad Messenger of God to be canceled. He mistakenly believed that the film would depict the Islamic prophet Muhammad, which is strictly forbidden in Islam. In reality, the film only depicted Muhammad's relatives, which is permitted within the religion. Secondly, he demanded that his family's murderers and the convicted murderers of Malcolm X be delivered to him. Of course, he had no idea that years later, two of the men convicted of Malcolm X's assassination would be acquitted. He also requested meetings with Imam Warth Muhammad and Muhammad Ali. Finally, he requested a refund of a $750 fine that he incurred during the trial of his family's killers when he made an emotional outburst during the proceedings. The movie release was canceled and the $750 was returned. 
However, Imam Warth Muhammad and Muhammad Ali did not meet with Callis, and the murderers of his family and Malcolm X were not delivered. Three ambassadors from Iran, Pakistan, and Egypt volunteered their services in negotiating an end to the standoff. They spoke with Callis over the phone and read passages of the Quran with him while asking him to end the siege. Finally, on March 11th, Callis ended the takeover. He and his accomplices were charged and convicted for their crimes. Callis was sentenced to 21 to 120 years in prison. He died in prison in 2003. Marion Barry would later become mayor of Washington, D.C., and the fifth floor press room in the Wilson Building was named after Maurice Williams in 2007. Honorable Salas Muhammad, founder of the Lost Foundation of Islam. On August 21, 1977, a member of the Nation of Islam tried to arrange a personal meeting with Imam Warth Muhammad. The Imam had taken over the Nation of Islam after the death of his father, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and since then had made dramatic changes. He declared that Master W.D. Farad was not God in person, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was not a prophet, and the organization would begin emphasizing teachings from the Quran instead of from the Bible. All of these changes were at direct odds with what had been taught in the Nation of Islam for almost 50 years. On that day in August, a man wanted to deliver a letter to Imam Warth Muhammad, which he hoped would show him that the Imam's changes were in error and reveal that he, the letter giver, had been designated by God to restore the Nation of Islam. The man who requested the meeting was an Honorable Minister Farrakhan. Instead, it was a man named Honorable Silas Muhammad. Months before Honorable Minister Farrakhan departed the Nation of Islam, Honorable Silas Muhammad, along with a few supporters, went to Atlanta to organize the Lost Found Nation of Islam, or LFNOI. Honorable Silas Muhammad feared that he would be killed for standing against the teachings of Imam Warth Muhammad. Today, he is revered by his followers for being so committed to the teachings of Master W.D. Farad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that he was willing to risk his life to stand up for them. The theologies of the LFNOI and the NOI have diverged. The LFNOI teaches that the end of the world has already come. They have a version of the Trinity wherein Master Farad is the father, Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the antitype to Mary, mother of Jesus, and these two figures are taught to have figuratively given birth to the Honorable Silas Muhammad. In reference to this teaching, the group celebrates October 7th, Honorable Elijah Muhammad's birthday, as Mother's Day. The Nation of Islam believes that Black people collectively have divine properties, but that these properties cannot be fully expressed. The Honorable Silas Muhammad, however, taught that all Black believers are gods today, but that he is the highest expression of God. The LFNOI and the NOI have oscillated between violent confrontation and tenuous peace over the decades. In the early 90s, there were discussions of possible unification. Honorable Farrakhan invited Honorable Silas Muhammad to the Million Man March. Allegedly, Honorable Silas Muhammad declined when he was told he would not be allowed to speak on stage about reparations, an issue which he had been dedicated to for years. As CEO of the LFNOI, Honorable Silas Muhammad has petitioned the United Nations, President Barack Obama, and the Pope of Rome for reparations for African Americans. In the late 90s, the two groups battled over newspaper territories. In one incident, a mosque of the LFNOI was firebombed. Honorable Silas Muhammad's followers accused members of the Nation of Islam of the attack. Nation of Islam members denied the allegations. Onlookers surmise that the firebombing could have been a publicity stunt staged by Honorable Silas Muhammad, who was struggling to attract members to his group. Rumors were spreading that Honorable Farrakhan was battling cancer, and some felt that Honorable Silas Muhammad saw this as an opportunity to grow his influence. Honorable Silas Muhammad has continued to implore Honorable Farrakhan and his followers to recognize him as a prophet, which has been a continuing source of tension. Only time can tell whether these two organizations will one day permanently join forces. Royal Jenkins, founder of the United Nation of Islam. Royal Jenkins joined the Nation of Islam while working as an over-the-road truck driver. 
Like Honorable Silas Muhammad and Honorable Louis Farrakhan, Jenkins did not agree with the changes of Imam Warth Muhammad after Honorable Elijah Muhammad's death. In 1978, he formed his own sect named the United Nation of Islam. The group has changed their name frequently and is also known as the Value Creators and the Promise Keepers. While believing that Allah came in the person of Master Farrard, Jenkins claimed that he was Allah in his own person and was more powerful. He claimed that the Nation of Islam was led astray by Imam Warth Muhammad and Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He says that Honorable Farrakhan is the most formidable enemy to Allah because he uses tricks and deceptive tactics to silence anyone else's voice and prepare the masses to fight for him through appearing to be against the white man and his government. Like many of his religious counterparts, Jenkins used the media to present his organization as one that was committed to community revitalization, entrepreneurship, and uplift. Behind the scenes, the reality for the organization's members was terrifying. In 2018, a woman won an $8 million judgment against the group after proving that they effectively enslaved her for 10 years. In the court ruling, the group was found guilty of trafficking the woman at 11 years old. They forced her to cook, clean, and care for children without pay or benefits at various organization-owned businesses around the country. Later, a judge ordered for Royale Jenkins to be arrested. The woman's story is not unique. Critics of the UNOI, as it is sometimes called, note that members work for the UNOI businesses and receive no income. They frequently must apply for welfare from the government and are only given the minimal necessities for survival. Meanwhile, leaders of the UNOI live lavishly from the group's proceeds. Members receive no health insurance and are not permitted to receive medical care outside of your colonic center, a UNOI-owned organization which does not employ any licensed physicians. Children were subjected to so-called Fruit of Islam beatdowns. Female members were required to maintain a certain weight or face humiliation and harassment. Members were limited to a diet of bean soup and salads. Sometimes they were forced to go for days, subsisting only on lemon juice. Even more disturbing than the allegations of financial improprieties and labor law violations are the reports that Jenkins has taken several wives from among his followers, including a teenage stepdaughter. From these unions, he has fathered at least 15 children. Jenkins claims that he is justified in practicing polygamy, comparing himself to Solomon and claiming that, quote, in the near future, a man will be known for his wisdom according to the number of wives that he has, end quote. In 2021, leaders of the group were indicted on new charges of forcing minors to work without pay and abusing them. Royal Jenkins was not indicted, and it was reported that that same year, he had died of COVID-19. Hulan Mitchell Jr., also known as Yahweh Ben Yahweh, founder of the Nation of Yahweh. Yahweh Ben Yahweh was born Hulan Mitchell Jr. on October 27, 1935 in Oklahoma and was raised in Kojic. He was the oldest of 13 children. In the 60s, he served in the military and went to law school before joining the Nation of Islam and changing his name to Hulan X. There are conflicting accounts about why he left the Nation of Islam. Some say that he fled when the organization accused him of embezzlement and pedophilia. One account claims that rival ministers were jealous of his rise and threatened him and his family, which forced him to leave for safety. In either case, Hulan X set out on his own. He started an independent church called the Modern Christian Church, in which he taught he was God and called himself Father Mitchell, seemingly inspired by the teachings of Father Divine from the 1920s. He fled his church when the congregants sued him for fraud. In 1979, he arrived in Miami and formed the Nation of Yahweh, which he also called the Temple of Love. He renamed himself Yahweh Ben Yahweh, which means God, Son of God in Hebrew. Yahweh Ben Yahweh borrowed teachings from the Nation of Islam and fused them with teachings from Black Hebrew Israelism. Like the Nation of Islam, he taught his followers that white people were evil and their 6,000-year reign on earth had come to an end. While the Nation of Islam taught that Master Farad was the Messiah of the Lost Found Nation of Islam, Yahweh bin Yahweh claimed to be the Messiah of the Lost Found Nation of Israel. 
Accordingly, Hebrew was used in the organization instead of Arabic. Likewise, instead of teaching that members were part of the tribe of Shabazz, Ben Yahweh claimed his followers were a part of the tribe of Judah. But like the nation of Islam, Yahweh Ben Yahweh was anti-Semitic and taught that Jewish people were imposters. He claimed that black people were the real Jews. Unlike the black Hebrew Israelites, however, Ben Yahweh emphasized the New Testament of the Bible, which he said was proof that he was Jesus, the Messiah. Yahweh Ben Yahweh gathered followers and slowly built a multi-million dollar Miami real estate portfolio, which included motels, a recording studio, a grocery store, and apartments. On the surface, it appeared as if Ben Yahweh had succeeded in revitalizing predominantly black areas and removing the blight of drug addiction and poverty from the properties he owned. But behind the scenes, there were reports of extortion, abuse, and murder. Followers were required to collect $10 daily. Those who failed were forced to kneel on concrete for over four hours as members with sticks stood by to ensure that backs were kept straight. Ben Yahweh also convened so-called midwife classes, where female members were forced to engage in sexual acts with each other and him. Robert Roger was born in Anchorage, Alaska to a military family in 1955. He was a gifted athlete and eventually gained a football scholarship to the University of California, Berkeley. Allegations of drug use and misconduct soured Roger's chances of a prosperous professional career. Eventually, he signed on to play for a professional football team in Canada. By 1982, he had amassed dozens of fraud warrants for writing bad checks. After a brief prison stint for fraud, he met Yahweh Ben Yahweh, donated all of his possessions to the group, and changed his name to Neariah Israel. Wanting to join Ben Yahweh's inner circle, Israel said he was asked to kill, quote, random white devils, end quote, as an initiation ritual. In April 1986, Israel decided to target white people that he perceived as weak. He went to a well-known gay neighborhood and followed a drunk white man to his home. He stabbed the man and his partner to death. This murder was the first of many for Israel and other members. When they killed their victims, they cut off their ears so they could bring them back to Ben Yahweh as trophies. In October of 1986, the Nation of Yahweh purchased a five-story apartment building in Opalaka, Florida, and attempted to evict all of its current residents. When two residents, 28-year-old Anthony Brown and 37-year-old Rudolph Brossard, resisted, they were shot dead. Neariah Israel was charged with one of the murders. At first, the nation of Yahweh supported Neariah Israel's defense by paying for his lawyer and waging a public relations campaign proclaiming his innocence. After Israel attempted to exert pressure in order to get a new lawyer, the organization swiftly withdrew their support. Israel subsequently confessed to his crimes and implicated other members in the organization, including Ben Yahweh. Neariah Israel was sentenced to 22 years in prison outside Florida under a new identity. Yahweh Ben Yahweh and other members were convicted of conspiracy to commit more than a dozen murders. After serving 11 years in prison, Ben Yahweh was released on parole in 2001, but restricted from communicating with his congregants by internet, telephone, computer, radio, or television. On May 7, 2007, Yahweh Ben Yahweh died at an unknown location from prostate cancer. Aaron Michaels and Khalid Muhammad, founder and developer of the New Black Panther Party. The story of the creation of the New Black Panther Party is a bit convoluted, but we will try to keep it short. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was founded in 1966 by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California. Unlike the Nation of Islam, the party didn't view all whites as evil or racist and actively sought to forge alliances across racial lines. They also didn't believe in do for self. While they launched numerous programs, including their iconic free breakfast for children program, they ultimately believed that the abolition of capitalism was a necessary first step to achieving freedom for black people and other oppressed groups. In short, the Nation of Islam was a conservative capitalist organization, while the original Black Panther Party was a leftist Marxist organization. The two organizations did have one thing in common though, both were targeted by the FBI. In response to the growing influence of the Black Panther Party, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover pledged to use every resource of his agency to crush the organization. 
He launched a counterintelligence program called COINTELPRO, which used agent provocateurs, sabotage, misinformation, and lethal force. By the 1970s, COINTELPRO had been successful in diminishing the Black Panther Party and fracturing its leadership. Fast forward to the 90s, violence was skyrocketing in Black communities, unemployment was rising, and investment in Black communities had declined. Many called for a resurgence of the Black Panther Party as a way to inspire the youth to organize and protest for better conditions. A 28-year-old assistant program manager at a Dallas radio station was interested in joining the Renaissance. Michaels worked on a radio station program called Talk Back Liberation Radio, where he inserted clips of speeches from Black activists of the past within recorded interviews of Black activists from the present. He was inspired by the interviews of figures like Milwaukee Councilman Michael McGee, who was using controversial militant tactics to secure funding for his constituents. Michaels assembled his own group of political fighters and called it the New Black Panther Party, or MBPP. The MBPP organized community programs and conducted armed patrols in drug-infested neighborhoods. Their focus was more on service programs than direct protest action. By 1996, many other similar groups had sprung up around the country. That same year, a scandal rocked Dallas. In September 1996, recordings of a white school board member named Dan Peavy were delivered to Black members of the board. In the recordings, Peavy refers to several board members and school children as the N-word. He also called a fellow board member a F-word. Peavy had already been embroiled in legal troubles. In May of 1996, he was indicted on 42 counts of bribery, extortion, money laundering, and tax fraud. A racial storm erupted. The MBPP, as well as other local activists, showed their outrage by protesting and shutting down school board meetings. At one meeting, a fight broke out between MBPP members and security guards. During the turmoil, a new figure, Khalid Muhammad, joined the leadership ranks of the MBPP and helped them present their demands to the community at meetings and press conferences. Khalid Muhammad had joined the resurrected Nation of Islam under Honorable Louis Farrakhan in the 1980s. In a story eerily similar to that of Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, Khalid became a popular speaker and trusted leader as he helped Honorable Farrakhan spread the Nation of Islam's teachings to a new generation. In the early 90s, Honorable Farrakhan began a rebrand of the Nation of Islam. He downplayed some of the organization's racial teachings, built bridges with liberal civil rights organizations like the NAACP, and began gathering support for an event called the Million Man March. Honorable Farrakhan envisioned the Million Man March as a moment of spiritual renewal, which would encourage Black men to reaffirm their commitment to community and family. In November of 1993, Khalid Muhammad gave a speech at King College in New Jersey that would tarnish Honorable Farrakhan's new image. The speech was entitled The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, based on a book with the same name that was published by the Nation of Islam. In the speech, Khalid Muhammad made several anti-Semitic proclamations. Just like Malcolm X with his infamous chickens come home to roost statement, Khalid Muhammad hadn't said anything that went against the Nation of Islam's teachings. The problem, of course, was the speech's timing and the news coverage it received. In February of 1994, Congress passed a formal condemnation of Muhammad's speech. Black civil rights groups also spoke out and encouraged Honorable Farrakhan to distance himself from Muhammad. Honorable Farrakhan responded by suspending him. He was careful to state that his decision to suspend Muhammad was based on the form of the speech and not the truth of the speech's contents. In other statements, he called the speech, quote, vile in manner, repugnant, malicious, mean-spirited, end quote. Rumors were circulating that leaders in the Nation of Islam had grown concerned over Khalid Muhammad's rise and were using the fallout from his speech to marginalize him. Taken aback by the response from his teacher, Khalid Muhammad laid low, hoping that he could one day reassume his leadership position in the Nation of Islam. In May 1994, a former Nation of Islam member named James X. Bess tried to kill Khalid Muhammad while he was speaking at a college. When the Nation of Islam's response to the shooting was ambivalent, Khalid Muhammad feared that the organization had been behind the assassination attempt. 
He began networking with other pro-Black groups around the country, including Black Panther groups, and hiring them as personal security guards instead of Nation of Islam members. In 1995, Khalid Muhammad arrived at the Million Man March, hoping that his time of exile was over, but he was barred from coming onto the stage. At that point, he realized he would never again be welcome in the Nation of Islam. Khalid turned his sights on the new connections he had made to Black Panther groups. He traveled to Dallas frequently and began advising Aaron Michaels about strategies for promoting the MBPP. After the Dan Peavy scandal, other racially incendiary events allowed Muhammad to demonstrate his publicity and organizing savvy. The MBPP elevated him to the position of chairman, where he was supposed to have equal authority to Aaron Michaels, who was now Minister of Defense. As chairman, Muhammad pushed the MBPP to sever ties with other Black Panther groups who were more committed to Michael's earlier focus on community service. At first, Michael's and other leaders supported Muhammad's idea to move in a new direction. Since Muhammad had become chairman, numerous members had left the Nation of Islam and joined the MBPP. These new members were all over the country and not just in Dallas, which transformed the MBPP into a national organization. Aaron Michaels believed that he and older members could balance out Khalid's views and shift new members to some of the positions of the earlier Black Panther Party. They were wrong. Khalid Muhammad continued to flex his power by changing the MBPP teachings. He added language to the organization's platform, which affirmed the, quote, truths of the Bible, Quran, and other sacred texts and writings, end quote. He also began using the white devil's theological framework which he had learned from the Nation of Islam to attract new members. Though Aaron Michaels tried to maintain his authority, it was too late. By the year 2000, outnumbered by Khalid and his supporters, and in the midst of a personal family crisis, Michaels resigned his position in the MBPP. Khalid Muhammad's leadership would not last long after Aaron Michaels' departure. On February 17, 2001, he died of a brain aneurysm. In subsequent years, Honorable Farrakhan has mended fences with the MBPP and its offshoots. Khalid Muhammad is an honorable mention on our list because he didn't create the new Black Panther Party, but he certainly transformed the organization significantly. Muhammad's successor, Malik Zulu Shabazz, accurately summarized Khalid Muhammad's impact by stating, the Nation of Islam has given birth to the new Black Panther Party on the national level. Under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam developed an interesting hierarchy where enterprising, well-spoken Black men were rewarded with leadership when they brought prophets and new members into the organization. The situation at the Philadelphia Mosque is an example of this model taken to the extreme. Some members went beyond high-pressure sales techniques and white-collar offenses into full-blown organized crime. However, even at less extreme mosques, it was well known that rewards came for those who could work their way up to leadership positions. Punishments, assaults, and assassinations like those of Clarence 13X served as a warning to those who thought they might set out on their own. Imam Worth Muhammad put a stop to all of this when he moved the organization to Orthodox Islam. There would be no more businesses for members to run, no more newspapers and bean pie sales, no more fruit of Islam to keep the faithful in line, no more nation of Islam, just Islam. For many, this was not enough. When you learn about how the nation of Islam really works, it's easy to condemn it. But is our nation any different? Who has the most wealth? Who performs the most work? How much of the so-called American dream is really mythology to hide these facts? The nation of Islam and the religious groups it inspired simply give us a better view of a reality we live every day.